Now, folks, uh, for the next phase of uh, the presentation, we're moving into the practical side of things. Uh, the first section that we're going to cover is the new practice note. Now, this is uh, some protocols that have been issued by His Honour Judge uh, O'Neill in the County Court. They're directed at the Geelong uh, Civil Circuit, or they're, they're said to be so, but this is reflective of uh, His Honour's approach in more recent times in Melbourne or so. And His Honour has always been a, a, a leader in relation to case management in the jurisdiction, and it remains to be seen um, what of these tips are picked up, but uh, our thoughts are that these are probably going to become uh, part of the more or less standard practice. Each judge, of course, has their own practice, but uh, our thoughts are that um, uh, these practical uh, matters set out in His Honour's protocols and procedures are going to be uh, echoed by other judges. And uh, I'll hand you over to Stephen for that. Thanks, Bruce. So just the backdrop is the existing uh, practice notes that we have that have been authorised by, by His Honour Judge Misso of November 2013. Uh, but Bruce is quite, quite right that His Honour Judge O'Neill has handed down some protocols and procedures for the Geelong Civil Circuit. I'm just going to go and touch uh, these points with you because, in my opinion, these are likely to be adopted or they could be adopted going forward into um, courts elsewhere and, and in the city. And I think it's an, it's an aim to make the serious injury uh, list more efficient, uh, especially time-wise. So in relation to SIs, each proceeding will be expected to be completed within the estimated time previously given. Uh, if it needs to go any, any longer, an explanation will be needed to be given uh, to the judge. We all know about court books that should only contain essential material, but here uh, this practice uh, states that it should only contain material that is intended to be relied upon and is relevant for the identified issues in dispute. So only relevant clinical notes will be admitted and large volumes of material will be rejected. At the start of the case, each counsel will be expected to open their respective cases for about 15 minutes each. Uh, gone are the days of uh, defendants, uh, counsel for the defendant standing up and saying this is a range case and they sit down. They're going to go, uh, they're going to need to go a little bit further than that and they're going to need to explain any evidentiary and legal issues uh, in dispute and, and go further in instead of just saying a credit or range case. Cross-examination of witnesses. This is a fun one. Now, we're only looking at the plaintiff predominantly. Anyone other than the plaintiff, uh, leave will need to be sought. And leave will be granted in appropriate circumstances, uh, but the pre precise matter or area to be cross-examined upon will need to be identified. And responses such as um, to challenge the opinion of the witness will no longer um, hold and be a sufficient basis to grant leave. It is expected that cross-examination of the plaintiff to take no longer than two hours. Uh, leave will be required if it goes beyond that. Closing addresses are limited to 30 minutes each. Uh, are, are, you, are you listening, Bruce? Um, and, Br and Bruce is actually going to be before his honour um, Judge O'Neill today, and these are thoughts of things to, to be to be uh, to bear in mind, not only from Bruce and my perspective and Paul's as well, but also our instructing solicitors. So we're all on the same page. The report to medical practitioners, which are old and not relevant to the identified issues in dispute, uh, and do not contain opinions based on relevant radiology or investigations, will not be admitted into evidence save with leave. Uh, there's also parts of the reports of vocational assessors which become, in effect, medical opinions, won't be uh, admissible as evidence. Also bear in mind, the current practice note from his honour Judge Misso does require uh, a statement of issues and also uh, earning capacity uh, calculations, but 
pursuant to this uh, protocol, there will be no need for parties to provide a statement of issues or a chronology. In cases involving a claim for economic loss, precise calculations as to earning capacity in accordance with the formulas uh, prescribed by subsections 38 F and G should be provided. So nothing's changed there. And generally speaking, there will always be exceptions. Leave will be granted where, where it's appropriate. However, uh, all of us should be aware of perhaps the changing phase of, of where things are headed as far as the running of the SI application. Uh, now, uh, uh, Paul is going to go through some practical tips and Bruce and myself will add in uh, some necessary comments along the way. Might try this microphone if everyone's... Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, so I think the thrust of the cases is really... It's quite a rigorous pathway to common law uh, under both schemes and it is becoming more rigorous in terms of the latest cases I think are, are reflecting um, less of a focus on an individual injury and the claimed consequences and sometimes in the past really the non-verifiable consequences of, of claimed, um, claimed injuries compared with reflecting what we all know about the, the messiness of, of modern lives. Like, like Mr Florimel, lots of claimants bring prior conditions to accidents that they um, unwittingly are unwittingly involved in uh, and they just it's a reality and it just it can be dealt with early and it can be dealt with successfully um, but it does set up a potential problem for, for plaintiff practitioners who who don't uh, deal with it early and really provides an opportunity for defendant practitioners to step in to that breach and and grapple with those those issues and really um, undermine a, a case so um, preparation really becomes all the more important in terms of bottom line, getting in all the clinical notes uh, and, and the tax returns and understanding what they say. Um, really focusing in on what else is going on in the person's life. And it's not, it's important to emphasise that, what's well, important to emphasise the, the your client should be telling you the the truth, it's, it's critically important because ultimately they'll be giving sworn evidence by way of affidavit and uh, viva voce evidence possibly if, if the matter goes to hearing. But uh, you really do need to know what's, what's going on so that you can deal with it and ask the right questions of, of doctors. Uh, and, but sometimes clients just don't remember, like that they're overwhelmed by the recent accident and trauma that they've been through or something that really um, doesn't seem like an issue to them from their past might look like an issue in, in the medical records and it, it still has to be dealt with. And we all see um, like typically chiropractor notes but also uh, um, GP notes that just are very, very difficult to, to understand but it is important that um, the plaintiff practitioners make an effort to, to understand um, what's, what's going on and so that they can understand what what is the actual injury that you're talking about? What are the actual consequences of that injury? And are there other injuries and conditions that are either um, causing different consequences or which are contributing to the same consequences or are actually the cause of the, um, the main consequences being complained of by the, by the plaintiff? And, and that extends to identifying um, uh, work and, and criminal history issues and other issues that are, are going on that are significant issues in, in the client's life. And so don't accept everything that they say at face value and, and, and really probe them uh, in terms of um, it's, it's a process um, that a lot of people don't, when they embark on it, they don't understand the level of scrutiny that their claims are involved to, uh, are subject to, and um, that the aim of the defendant practitioner is really to know um, to know their case ultimately through the process of subpoenaing records better than, um, than maybe intimate family members of, of the plaintiff in many, many cases. Uh, so the focus is on accident injuries, other conditions, consequences, and importantly, negligence. Don't, don't, um, 
don't forget that at any stage, um, particularly in, uh, in, in TAC claims. Don't, don't make any assumptions. And also in, in psychiatric claims under, under work cover, we see how critical uh, that is. So, but having, having done that preparation, it is important that you do form some sort of early view and, and then um, try to move quickly because things change uh, and explain serious injury. I don't, don't think that we do necessarily a good enough job of explaining what is not really an intuitive uh, process to, to plaintiffs uh, in terms of uh, they move my, maybe from an impairment assessment where it's, it's all the injuries that they have from an accident compared to really trying to hone in on uh, an injury that is serious as being produ productive of uh, consequences that are serious for them as, as an individual. And so they may have injuries that they think are more serious, um, but in terms of the, the statutory test and the way the courts are interpreting these cases, it might turn out that their, their right thumb injury is really the one that's producing the consequences for them that would satisfy the, um, the test. Uh, and whereas they might think that general complaints of pain uh, might be assisting their, their cause, really they, they don't and they, 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 it's legitimate to, to tell them that what, what the law is about on those cases. And in preparing these cases, chronologies are really absolutely essential. The, the earlier you can do a detailed chronology to just um, see what's happened in treatment, um, radiology, what's happening in work and, and other issues. So you, you then can identify the issues that have to be dealt with. And in some cases, you can identify the issues that, that really aren't issues. So if a manual employee periodically has you know, a bit of a back um, problem, but then goes on to have a, a fracture in, um, uh, in an accident, then, then really um, it might not be such, such an issue. And with the chronology, you can identify key gaps in treatment and you can identify inconsistencies. So you can identify um, two different events um, that, um, that might pose a, a problem for your client and you can seek an explanation in relation to, um, to why, um, why someone went on holidays and, and why there was a backdated medical certificate at the, at the same time. And that chronology then forms the basis of your, your client's story, which is a, a developing story. Uh, and in terms of the, uh, the rigour um, for that story, you really need um, very, very good detail from them in terms of what is the pain like, where is it from, and what are the, what are the consequences, which, which injury is precisely is responsible for those consequences. And um, on the other side, the defendants uh, in analysing those consequences are really looking at well, is, is, that, is that right? Well, what about these other um, conditions or, or injuries? Can't they, uh, mightn't they be contributing or in fact the actual cause of, of those, those problems? And sometimes, um, um, particularly early on in an injury, um, like sleep, um, it might significantly be dis disrupted through, through pain, but then maybe later on, someone's still sleeping poorly, but but perhaps it's more anxiety and financial stress that's, that's causing that. So um, the, uh, the affidavit that's developed from this process is um, really a snapshot at that time and typically is, is updated by a subsequent affidavit, but it's also informed by, by medical histories that the, the plaintiff provides over, over the course of a, a case. So it is, it's a key part of the evidence, but it is not, is not the whole case. And for that reason, I really don't like to see it um, sent to medical examiners as part of their instructions as a form of substitute for the history that they should be obtaining from the client on each occasion. Uh, and um, except in, you know, um, certain cases, children or um, really um, um, traumatic um, events. Um, but um, what we are seeing from cases like um, Florimel is that um, it's the medical practitioners who um, really carefully um, review the documents and obtain a careful history whose reports will stand out in these disentangling cases as the ones that, that should be 
accepted. And um, in that case of um, Florimel, uh, the Court of Appeal did highlight um, the, the process by which um, Mr Kearse uh, was given a letter from TAC solicitors, who I believe are Lander, Lander and Rogers in that case, which set out extensively Florimel's medical history, including the problems he suffered from before and after the accident, and enclosed the key documents. And then Mr Kearse, in providing his report, acknowledged that he'd read and reviewed those documents and that they clearly formed a basis of um, the opinion that he provided in, in that report. Um, and it's, so it's important, um, more important for plaintiff practitioners that the process um, that you adopt early leads to the instructions to the medical examiner rather than waiting for the medical examiner to provide a report to you to guide you in your case. If, if you haven't properly instructed your medical examiner from the start in terms of pre-existing uh, and if your client fails to inform them of their pre-existing history then really uh, it, it may already be too hard to, to recover the situation by then um, saying, oh, by the way, um, there was this that you know, the client doesn't appear to have told you about. But the, the, the doctor by that stage has already expressed an opinion uh, and they're then in the difficult position of trying to um, provide a path of reasoning to support their original opinion but then takes into account the new information that they've just been provided. And if a defendant is able to come in with a doctor who has it all in front of him or her and um, provides a report to the contrary, then that's bound to, um, to carry more, more weight. Um, just, um, just on that um, before we move on, my impression is that um, maybe IMEs aren't really keeping up with these um, case law developments in terms of the need for disentangling. And so some of them, we still see reports where um, they might be talking about consequences from two injuries which they don't properly um, distinguish between. Um, but, there, but there are also some very good doctors who would be outstanding witnesses who we don't get to hear from in court and they provide quite short, terse reports where you can't really tell what history they've obtained or really um, set out a basis for their opinion, and they can be just they can be just sidelined. Um, and also, whereas you previously risked a report being sidelined, particularly for defendant practitioners, would see it all the time where uh, doctors weren't cross-examined. Now, not only is that that's not the only risk. Now, the risk is that um, for plaintiff practitioners, that if you um, have a doctor who provides a report that doesn't properly disentangle, then that can actually be used against you in terms of a disentangling argument, so it becomes part of your opposition to this case. Um, probably enough from me for a minute. I'll just add a couple of points just in relation to affidavits. Watch out for absolutes. The words never, can't, always, don't. I hate those words. Just watch out for them. With pain and uh, when you're talking about pain, think about intensity, frequency. Don't just say, I've got pain. Uh, make sure that if you're acting for the plaintiff, it's in the plaintiff's own words. Really important. So they understand when they're being cross-examined, you know, oh, they chose to choose to put applicant or respondent or, you know, they all four or five disprotrusion. They actually know what they're talking about. Looking at the before and after picture, and when you tell them, Look, this affidavit is like you giving evidence in the witness box. They, they stand up and they go, ooh, this is important. I've got to make sure this is right. So make sure that everything in that document is 100% accurate. They're the sorts of things to, to think about. And think about that IFCA uh, construct affidavit, which Paul spoke about earlier this morning. Don't fix it just before the hearing. Get it right at the very, very start with the affidavit. Make sure you have those prior injuries in there. Make sure that... Uh, those previous workers' comp claims are in there as well, if there's any. Um, just uh, one matter that I've seen from recent experience in both psychiatric and physical injury cases is making sure your medical evidence is up to date from the treaters. I've had two cases adjourned in recent times, one physical, one psychiatric, where the 
Shortly prior to the hearing, the plaintiff had uh, embarked on a new form of treatment or was about to embark on a new form of treatment. Each case was one where the plaintiff tried to barrel on, uh, or those peering for the plaintiff tried to barrel on, until when I was called upon by the bench to identify the issues, issue one, permanency, the guns are then turned on the plaintiff's counsel. Why are you proceeding with this case if you can't prove permanency? It's something that, it, if it pops up on the morning in conference or the afternoon before in conference, there's not much to be done about it, save that you, you face up to it and you deal with it because the plaintiff only gets one shot at these things and you'd hate to be the practitioner that pushed on with something that wasn't ready to go because of permanency issues. If you adjourn it for a period to investigate that treatment, you'll be able to report back to the bench one way or the other as to whether or not you can establish permanency. In an ideal world, the client might actually improve and the process, the whole serious injury process might go away. But if, if they don't improve, you can at least report that back, that yes, there's no issue about permanency. This form of treatment has been investigated and failed. Now, another matter that um, needs attention in these cases is economic loss. If you win economic loss, you win the lot. And it can come down to something as crude as the numbers. If you can show, now I'm, I'm directing attention here at the 134OB process because it's uh, there's so much of it around. Um, if you can show that the without injury earnings are a high figure, then 60% of that is also a high figure. And if the best that can be offered in terms of alternate, off, uh, alternate jobs generate figures under that, plaintiff wins. That's putting it very crudely. But if you win on economic loss, you win on pain and suffering. So the numbers, the numbers, the numbers still are not being given proper attention on both sides of things. It's, everyone's lifted their game in, in recent times, and I know it's just a barrister pontificating, but this is just coming from the coalface in terms of what you deal with at these cases, and you see the missed opportunities on both sides. Um, when you're looking, there's, there's a reference at the end to Giancos. Giancos talks about without injury earnings, or with injury earnings. And it talks about suitable employment, and it talks about real jobs. So the internet generated cut and paste stuff that we've seen in the past is of limited assistance, particularly when it doesn't give you any idea of what the job involves. Giancos says the court, the, the, in Giancos the court said, look, what we need to know are the inherent physical requirements of the job. Don't tell me the abstract um, motherhood statements about what they, the position may or may, it may not involve. What does it mean in terms of standing, sitting, bending, lift, lifting, twisting? Even if you're more selective in the jobs that you choose, and pick a couple, focus on those, get a proper assessment of those couple and run with that. And have that assessment done by someone who's at least medically qualified or quasi-medically qualified and then have that sent to a medically qualified person to comment upon. And uh, with any luck, uh, they'll, back, they'll back each other uh, and the defendant will then be able to present that sort of work as suitable employment. For the plaintiff, you do the same. If you get um, material from the defendant suggesting jobs A, B, C, send it off to your doctors. There's no, there's no point in having the disconnect that we so often have of vocational assessors, typically unqualified um, uh, in terms of the relevant issues, suggesting jobs A, B, C, doctors suggesting uh, light work, whatever that means, uh, and no cross-referencing of the two. So it's something that each side uh, can look at and should look at because the economic loss is such an important thing. And when it comes to one final word on the economic loss is the without injury earnings, the, what they could have been earning. Don't just stop at the, the date of the injury and don't just average back three years before that. Look at what someone uh, in comparable employment, in, uh, a comparable employee earned in the three subsequent years. That drags your figures up, and you can point to, you can say, look, it's the without injury earnings in the three years post injury, which is the relevant maximum period, are X. Sixty percent of X is Y, and that's that's a high figure. It beats all the suitable employment options that are being put forward. It's something that uh, can always uh, be improved upon. Uh, get the documents by way of notices to produce, by way of um, um, uh, that's probably one way to do it if it needs to be, but it's something that needs to be explored properly. 
Similarly, if there are any uh, problems in your client's employment history leading up to the case, leading up to the employment with the defendant, for example, or if there's any patches of um, unemployment or patches where, uh, where the income tax returns suddenly, the gross income suddenly drops down, have an explanation for that, get it out front. And finally, the, the importance of diffusing the bombs in advance can't be overstated. As the plaintiff's representatives setting up a case, you have the best opportunity to get it right. An affidavit that comes in later saying, look, I've just seen all this stuff that the defendants produced. My solicitors have just shown me all this stuff. It might look really bad, but this, this is my explanation. That sort of affidavit is generally regarded as being fairly obvious. It's a fairly obvious device, particularly when it's contrasted with the earlier fulsome affidavit where the clients either denied any prior claims or prior injuries or has downplayed them. You just set your client up for that obvious contradiction and it's something that can be avoided. And equally for the defendants, that's exactly what you're looking for. You're looking for those things, you're looking for the bombs that are hidden in the clinical records or in other histories. Histories, even if it's histories in relation to previous claims, uh, there can be material there as to what hobbies or interests had to be given up because of a previous injury, for example. So there's some of the matters that you can look at. Uh, these things are becoming more focused in terms of the running. If this new model is, uh, becomes uh, the, the standard, if the, the Judge O'Neill's model becomes the standard, it's even more important that this be, um, uh, everyone ha have their house in order and have their case in order. Uh, these cases are uh, interesting and challenging. Uh, there's a lot of preparation and they are over before you know it. And the final word that I'd uh, like to add is in relation to court books. The court books are the key documents. Uh, just focus on the things that you think you need to prove your case, and particularly for the defendants. Uh, have, your have your documents in there that you either want or might want. Don't overload the bench. I, I don't think anyone does overload the bench and the other side too much anymore. Everyone's a bit uh, fairly economical. But equally, don't rely on being able to uh, tender swathes of material during the running of the case, depending on the bench, they may or may not allow it because the whole idea of the court book is it's supposed to uh, reflect the documents you intend to rely upon. So uh, there's a, a bit of preparation leading up to it, um, but it will make the running of the case more streamlined and it will um, make the uh, presentation of your respective side's case more streamlined and more appealing to those hearing it. Yes, and uh, I'm minded of the time. Are there any questions? We've obviously done our job well. Thank you very much for your time.